Appreciate it. Well, good afternoon. My talk is going to be a little bit different from the other talks that you've heard in this session, and I'm going to be speaking about intellectual property. Um, it can be considered a little bit of a dry subject, but I submit that it's of critical importance to the industry that you folks work in, and uh, it's one that I've spent a lot of time focusing on as well for, I think, the same reasons that you do. Uh, it's critically important for advancing healthcare, both here and abroad. Um, critical to a, having a successful uh, personalized medicine industry is the ability to protect the investment that goes into making the discoveries that translate into improved outcomes. Um, and central to this is having a functional patent system, one that accomplishes the dual goals of incentivizing investment and providing access. Um, so I'm going to begin today. Here we go. Mm, try that way. What am I doing wrong here? Got it. Okay. So I'm going to begin by providing a quick overview of some of the recent cases that deal with a statute that uh, lawyers call 35 U.S.C. Section 101. It's a patentable subject matter statute. It's a gating statute that determines what gets let into the patent system. Um, traditionally, it's been a very low hurdle, but it's been receiving increasing scrutiny lately in a series of cases that I'm going to go through. And I'm going to end my discussion with a talk of the Prometheus decision that was argued at the Supreme Court December 7th will be decided sometime this term before October. As I said, um, patents are traditionally used to incentivize, to incentivize investment. And they do that by granting inventors a limited period of exclusivity in, exclu in, in exchange for disclosure. And um, the patent system is set out in the Constitution, in Article I, Section 8, and the authorizing language is there. There is, however, some concern that the patent system is out of balance. And on the other side of um, incentivizing investment, you have the need to promote access. And the concern that the courts have been struggling with for some time is the notion that there's a thicket of patent rights that is arising from too much protection over um, too f thin advances, basically. And it's this notion of the tragedy anti-commons, that nu having numerous right holders is actually frustrating the thought behind the patent system, which is to promote innovation. In fact, it's doing exactly the opposite. And keeping these two competing objectives in balance is, I believe, what's going on in the number of court cases that have come up lately that deal with Section 35 USC 101 in the context of method patents. And it's method patents that are often used to provide the broadest protection for the discoveries in the personalized medicine industry. So the, the question that the courts are asking is, um, what subject matter should be excluded from patent protection? And traditionally, there have been three broad exclusions that are uh, referred to as abstract ideas and products of nature and laws of nature. And as I said earlier, usually 35 USC was a very, very low threshold. You never heard of cases being rejected on the basis of patentable subject matter. The, language from some of the earlier cases, when anything under the sun made by man is subject to patent protection. But the exclusions represent the general store of knowledge that should be reserved to everyone um, so that basic science is not impeded. And the question is, how do you balance these competing objectives? So what I wanted to do was go through a couple of court cases um, that have started um, as early as about 2006. Um, that have made the, up to the Supreme Court. I'm going to talk about cases that either have gone up or are on their way up. The first one I want to talk about is a, a case called LabCorp. How many of you have heard of the LabCorp case? Show of hands. So maybe about half of you. Um, LabCorp was a case that was interesting for a couple of reasons. It went up to the Supreme Court in 2006. They decided to take it. And then they dismissed the case without ever ruling on it. Um, and they dismissed it because they said that the issue that they had gone up on was not adequately briefed below. An issue in this case was a, a claim that was directed to a diagnostic. And the diagnostic was for determining whether or not a patient had a vitamin B deficiency. And it turned out that it was easier to measure in these patients the level of an amino acid homocysteine rather than to measure vitamin B. And so it was the basic correlation between homocysteine levels and a certain B vitamin that was discovered and patented um, by the LabCorp scientists. And um, actually, by the metabolite scientists. LabCorp was on the other side of this. Um, 
the claims basically recited a, met a method of determining vitamin B deficiency by measuring homocysteine and correlating that level to vitamin B. Um, these are called assay and correlate claims. They're a very useful type of claim, have been used for a long period of time. And the question that the Supreme Court considered and did not answer is whether these claims are unpatentable because they're claiming a law of nature, the basic correlation which exists in the body, independent of whether um, someone discovered them. It's a pre-existing law of nature is the argument. Um, I want to point out the claim was allowed by the Patent and Trademark Office at the trial court level. The claim was found to be not invalid. Uh, courts don't determine that claims are valid. They determine that they're not invalid, so the claim was sort of stamped as a good claim, and the claim was held to be infringed. And same result at the Federal Circuit, which is the appellate court level, went up to the Supreme Court, and as I said, they declined to actually answer the question, uh, but not before uh, Judge Breyer issued a very uh, strong and blistering dissent where he said that the claims should not be allowed because they're a law of nature, that they, uh, having claims like this burden the healthcare system, and one very, I think encouraging development was in the Prometheus case that was just argued, uh, you can tell from the transcript that Breyer seems to be softening his view, which I take as a very hopeful sign. So the next case I want to talk about is the Bilski decision. And Bilski's interesting, it had nothing to, be, for the following reason, had nothing to do with life science. It dealt with the method of hedging, you know, sort of financial transaction. But I think it speaks to the point that you have very diverse interests that are um, fighting for attention in the patent system and results that are created by one industry can have very adverse impact on another industry such as ours. So um, Bilski related to this test for hedging and uh, the Federal Circuit said that the claim was invalid because it didn't recite either the use of a machine or a physical transformation. So this is the so-called machine or transformation test that the Federal Circuit had articulated was a necessary test for determining patent eligibility of method claims under 101. The um, Supreme Court took the case and it said, no, we never said that um, the exclusive test was machine or transformation. And again, hopeful language, what the Supreme Court said was that um, Section 101 should be considered a dynamic provision that's designed to encompass new and unforeseen inventions. And they actually cited advanced diagnostics as one of the types of inventions that they were concerned about in issuing this um, very relaxing ruling that kind of softened what the Federal Circuit was doing with regards to Section 101. The, the next case that came up is Klassen. Now, Klassen is an interesting case for a number of reasons. The, Reasoning in the decision, I think, is somewhat suspect for reasons that I won't have time to go into, but I'd be happy to talk to you about offline. Um, there were a number of different types of claims that were at issue, a very large number of claims. And the basic phenomenon that was being addressed here is the notion that the schedule upon which immunizations are given to young children can impact the frequency of autoimmune side effects. So there were two types of claims. There were claims that were directed to determining what the optimal uh, schedule was. And then there was a second set of claims that used that optimal schedule to actually determine when to give the vaccine. So fairly similar claims that differed only in the second set, including the additional step of administering. Now, there are challenges that arise by needing to include an administering step that relate to the way that infringement is determined. You have to have in a method claim one party practicing all the steps. So you can see a situation arising where if it's one entity that figures out what the optimal schedule is, and then a second entity, a physician, that actually administers the vaccine, the test that requires both steps might not be infringed. And so that claim could be commercially useless, even though it turns out to be a valid claim. So um, I think the way to think about this case, which um, went up to the Supreme Court, um, is that there were two different types of claims here. One could be thought of as the law of nature itself, the notion that there's uh, an impact between the schedule and the side effects. And then the other is the application of the law of nature, which is the notion that um, the time that, that you actually have to administer according to that schedule in order to minimize the side effects. The, the next case that I want to talk about before I get to Prometheus, and we've got about four minutes remaining, three and a half minutes, I'm going to talk a little bit faster, 
is um, this is the, these are the claims that relate to bracket one and bracket two. And this case was watched very hotly for a number of reasons. First, um, at issue was whether or not we were going to be able to claim isolated nucleic acid molecules or whether those were not um, subject to patent protection because they were actually compositions of nature um, and or products of nature. And the Solicitor General, which is the government's lawyers, they actually submitted a brief suggesting that some of the isolated nucleic acid molecule claims should not be patentable. They also um, had some things to say about the method claims. This case um, went up to the Federal Circuit. It's not yet gone to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court's not yet decided whether it's going to hear this case. But what the Federal Circuit did was first it said, OK, isolated nucleic acid molecules remain patentable. That was a very good decision. Uh, but it did invalidate the method claims, which were related to methods of determining the existence of a germline mutation. I want to point out that there were a number of other method claims that were not at issue. And uh, so I don't know the, how broadly you can read this. The claims that related to actually using that information to prognose cancer risk were not at issue in this case. So unclear what this case actually is going to turn out to mean or whether or not the Supreme Court is going to take it. So the last case that I want to talk about is the case that was um, actually argued um, on December 7th, which is the Prometheus case. Um, these claims related to the administration of a particular type of drug for the treatment of a set of diseases. And at issue here were claims that related to effectively figuring out whether you were in the right dose range. So they looked at the level of, of metabolite. And they said if you're within these boundaries, you're good. And if you're below, you should, it indicates a need to increase the dose. And if you're above, it indicates a need to decrease the dose. And the question that the court considered were, were these claims so broad as to cover a basic law of nature? That is, that the drug works within a particular therapeutic index? Um, or are the claims instead um, directed to the application of a law of nature? So um, there was a transcript from the hearing on December 7th, and I think if you want to do a little bit of tea leaf reading, I think there are hopeful signs here. So the justices recognize that the claims cover the useful discovery that requires significant investment. And here's Judge Breyer saying that um, it's expensive and there's a lot of investment to be protected. They recognize that the claims are not directed to, the, that they're directed to the use of a law of nature, not to the law of nature itself, which is, I think, also a very helpful indication. Breyer, importantly, um, pointed out that he made a mistake in the, his, this, his dissent in LabCorp where he said that he thought it was a law of nature that was being patented. Here he says he recognized that it was the application in LabCorp just as it is here. And the justices do appear to recognize that limits within the claim prevent it from preempting all uses of this law because it, there's a bound of um, ranges that are called out in the claim. So where does this leave us? Well. I think the Prometheus decision is unlikely to create any major changes. I think the judges are going to use a very light hand in deciding it. Um, hopefully, we'll have some clarification as to how broad is too broad. And the last thing I want to say is that the principles and strategy for maximizing IP protection in view of the evolving case law are going to be covered tomorrow in talks by Catherine Polizzi and Pauline Former-Coppenol. Thank you so much.